What a thrill it must have been for Simon Peter when he realized that Jesus was standing on the shore not far away. It was after the resurrection and seven disciples went back out to fish on the Sea of Galilee. After toiling all night and catching nothing, they saw a distant figure who asked them if they'd caught anything and told them to put the net on the right side of the boat. And when they did, they could hardly haul in the great catch, 153 large fish. Then the disciple that Jesus loved said to Simon Peter, it's the Lord. And then the light came on, the fire in his heart, the expectation and anticipation must have been immeasurable. No wonder Simon Peter put on his outer garment, threw himself from the boat into the water and made his way to land so that he could be with Jesus. What hope we have because Jesus Christ is alive to know that he's never far away. In that case, just about a hundred yards, but no matter where we are, he's promised to be with us all the way through, even to the end of the age. At the same time, Peter might not have known what would happen next because there they found a charcoal fire already with fish and bread prepared and the Savior said come and have breakfast and then he led Simon Peter through what we're going to call a self check as he asked him three times do you love me and as Peter responded and Peter was troubled because of that third time because he had denied Jesus three times but on each occasion Jesus next said feed my sheep tend my lambs care for my flock and then he told Peter what would come in the future that he would be taken where he didn't want to go and his hands would be stretched out possibly a reference to his ultimate crucifixion and Jesus said follow me and when Peter looked at the disciple Jesus loved, he asked Jesus, what about him? And Jesus said, you just focus on what you are to do. Glorify God all the way to the very, very end. During this pandemic crisis, we have the opportunity for self-reflection. That is with some additional time perhaps, we're not commuting, many of us not working as we typically would in the same place. School activities, extracurricular events, hobbies, some things have had to be put on hold and so we find ourselves looking in the mirror and saying, who am I? What is my life about? Where am I headed? And it's an opportunity for us to take inventory about our faith and our hope and our love, our walk with the Lord, our commitment to his word and to sharing the good news of salvation with others. I've noticed in the Keller Church of Christ how so many have continued to reach out with whatever means they have. I received another card this week from one of our children, this time from a boy who's very precious to all of us. The outside says, a sweet friendship refreshes the soul, Proverbs 27, 9. And then he wrote, dear Mr. Corey, I hope you're having a great time at home. We miss you very much. Thank you for doing the church service on Sunday. And then he signed it sincerely in his name. What a bright spot as each person can find someone to uplift, someone to show attention to and kindness to. Pick up the phone, get online. Share your relationship with Christ with those around you. I asked various people if they would tell us what they had learned about themselves during this critical period. I'm reminded of one man writing about this virus who said, you know, I always told myself that whenever I had the time, I would clean out the garage. He said, now I've realized that was not the problem. In other words, he still wasn't doing what he thought he would do because time doesn't necessarily guarantee that we'll be about what we ought to be doing. Tanya and I have been talking about how little we actually need in order to live. All the things that people accumulate that we keep up with and manage, but then we also found that the few things we do really need are hard to find at the grocery store. 
maybe you've had that same experience. But I thought about this fellow with the garage, and I remembered that I had in a box some gloves, a large package of them, and I went out to retrieve those just in case we needed them, and as I was looking, I found something that I had bought long ago and I had forgotten all about. That's right, 3M masks, and they are N95. I'm not hoarding them. I'm not price gouging on them. I'm not auctioning them off, but I have two or three of these if I need them. I was pleased to hear from our son and daughter about some things they've reflected on. Christopher said, time alone at home has made me a lot more thoughtful about my personal life and relationships and spiritual life and made me realize how much being at the office and out at other places can take away from that important time. I'm using this time to work on renewing my focus and trying to align my priorities better. I consider myself to be pretty independent, but this has also been a reminder of how important it is to have healthy social interaction. It's an important factor to help us stay challenged, motivated, and purposeful. And then we heard from Carissa about the value of little things, how much I've taken for granted, she said. She asked the question, what if you woke up today and only had the things that you thanked God for yesterday? Today, she said, I jumped for joy. I was able to get eggs, chicken, and bread, things I never even considered that I wouldn't be able to find. I'll thank God every day for the little things so I won't take them for granted tomorrow. One of our brothers who's with us here today said, I learned how much I need to be in contact with other people in order to feel a part of the Lord's church. A couple wrote back and spoke about meeting together to worship and how much they miss that togetherness. Also said that a member of their family that had left the church was restored and confessed their sins and that that man's wife was baptized into Jesus Christ this week. Isn't that tremendous? Because of reflection, because of conversations, because of people thinking about people and what life is all about and where we're headed. One of our sisters noted, I remember that I love the solitude and quiet of my back porch early in the morning. I wonder how many of us haven't taken the time to look at the sunrise to enjoy the beauty of God's creation, to watch the sunset, to take part in. We've had some cool breezes lately. It's been so nice and so very, very special. Many of you know our dear brother who recently lost his wife, Dave Dunham, and was out and now back with us again. This is what he wrote. He said, I'm in a very unique moment of life because of his bereavement amplified now by this imposed shut-in status. What I've noticed is a feeling within myself for the pain of others and their mates and families. And then he names several in our church group. I seem to have a much greater awareness of the pain of those who are alone at this time. Think of all the hospital and care center bound people that cannot be visited. They must feel absolutely abandoned. And then he felt the sadness of those that are cut off from their familiar ties by this situation. So I want us to think about several things in the scripture that cause us to come before the mirror. You remember James wrote by inspiration that the word of God gives us a view of who we are, but once we look at it, we're not to go away without change, but instead to incorporate those areas of improvement that God would have us pursue. So I thought of these scriptures. If you'd like to open your Bible, we'll be in Psalm 19 and then a couple of other Psalms. This is that beautiful passage that starts out by talking about the, the works of God and then the word of God. The heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament or the expanse shows his handiwork. And then he talks about God's truths, his statutes, his judgments, his laws, enlightening the eyes, making wise the simple, causing us to be pure. And he says, moreover, by them your servant is warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. And then he said, who can discern one's own errors? That is, it's difficult for us to admit that I've been wrong. I need to repent. I need to turn from sin and come back and be closer to God. 
And then this prayer, declare me innocent from hidden faults. You struggle, I'm sure, as I do, with the sins that are not so apparent. Maybe we've buried them deep within. Maybe we've ignored them. Maybe we've rationalized that they're not that serious. And so this opportunity we have, which is very unusual, unprecedented, and yet such a blessing to look long and hard, openly and transparently, and to come before God. And then this keep back your servant from presumptuous sins. That is, sins where I might presume or assume to do more than God has taught me to do, to go my own way. Let them not have dominion over me. I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. And what a prayer. Verse 14, pray this in your thought, in your own words. Let the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Psalm 26, I noted that sometimes in Scripture, one who has examined himself fairly comes out saying, I am faithful, genuine, walking in the light, living for the Lord. So this inventory helps us see what needs to be rejected, but also what is to be confirmed and strengthened even further. So in Psalm 26, and this is not unusual, think of the book of Job and what he went through and he took inventory and he, he said, you know, I, I, haven't, I haven't done evil to bring this on. So sometimes the psalmist will talk about his mind and his heart, his eyes and his walk and his refusal to endorse the sinful actions of others. I've walked in integrity. So if that's your conclusion, be honest, be open, and be humble. But don't fail to acknowledge the fact that God is working in your life. And there are many things in your life that show the Spirit of God dwelling in you. So this inventory is not necessarily all punitive or negative. And then going back to 2 Samuel 12 and then Psalm 51, you recall how David had tried to cover up his sin with Bathsheba. He had to be confronted by Nathan the prophet who finally said to him, you are the man, after telling him a story about a ewe lamb that was taken by a rich neighbor. And that led David to do the self-check. I have sinned. And then he wrote in Psalm 51, Lord, blot out my sin. Make me whiter than snow. My sin is ever before me. I've sinned against you only. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Uphold me with a willing spirit. And verse 13 goes on to say, Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will be converted to you. So out of this inventory comes a renewed interest in souls, in those around us that are lost and needy, that are abandoned, that are hurting. We need to go to the mirror first, and then we can help them as well. Psalm 119, the longest chapter in the Bible, I found verse 59, When I think on my ways... There it is. Then I turn my feet. If I don't think of my ways, I'm going to keep walking the same way I have. Need to do an inventory. Oh, Psalm 139. Search me, O oh God. Know my heart. Try me. Know my thoughts. If there's any grievous way in me, lead me in the way that's everlasting. And then we come to the New Testament. You know, during this current circumstance that we face... You and I see a lot of people more gracious and kind, thoughtful and patient than they might otherwise be, and hopefully all of us are that way. But perhaps you're also seeing that some in our culture are impatient and critical and complaining. Maybe it's about some food delivery, or it's the travel industry, or it's the president, or it's the state or local government and we can find fault, we can nitpick, we can be upset with everybody. We don't want to use this time to do that. 
because unless we can fix it, unless we can help it, unless we can improve it, we're not going to do anything but just work ourselves up about that which is beyond our control. You and I would like to fix everything in the whole world, but we can, by the grace of God, start with ourselves. Oh, those specks in other people's eyes. And oh, you'll see it on social media, it's back and forth and back and forth. Hey, I, I've got a log in my eye. And now with this break from the regular routine, I can address it. Then I can help my brother with the speck. Oh, we've observed the bread and the cup today. Let a man examine himself and judge himself so that we not be judged by the Lord when the great day comes. And you have to think of 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Examine yourselves to see whether you're in the faith. Test yourselves. Jesus Christ, be sure that he is in you. Don't fail to meet the test. Let each one examine himself, his own work, Galatians 6, 3 and 4, instead of distracting ourselves with where other people fall short. So easy to do. So let's go back to that scene in John 21, and let's notice that Jesus calling the disciples, Peter, to bring some of the fish that was caught to this fire where there was already fish cooking. And there, in a scene reminiscent of Simon Peter's betrayal, denial, the only other place in the Bible where this word for charcoal fire is used, only used two places, the charcoal fire where Peter said three times, I don't know him, and three times when he said, yes, I love you. And there's a purpose for this fire. Well, there was the concern, the question, do you love me? And the comparison more than these, which could be understood in several different ways. In the Greek text, it could be taken as, Peter, do you love me more than other people love me? Or, do you love me more than you love these people? Or, do you love me more than you love these things, fishing and boats and your work? In any case, Peter was called to check himself with that question. And each time when he responded in the affirmative, Jesus said, shepherd my sheep, or something to that uh, effect. Glorify God. Well, there's a confusion. Peter, just like so many of us, he sees the disciple that Jesus loved. We think that's John. And says, what about him? If I'm going to have to go through a tough time and see what Peter is doing... What's Jesus doing? Jesus is asking Peter. What does Peter want to do? He wants to turn the mirror. He wants to look at somebody else. Is he going to have to do what I have to do? And Jesus said, what is that to you? Jesus didn't promise that John would remain, but he said, if he remains until I come, what is that to you? Tend my sheep. Follow me. Glorify God, even to the death, even if your hands are going to be stretched out and you'll be taken where you wouldn't want to go, possibly a reference to his crucifixion. Jesus knew the answer, but Simon needed to be asked three times at a charcoal fire because that had happened to him previously. Peter needed to consider his own convictions he needed a chance, like we all do, to change his answer. Is that your final answer? Well, what he said just a short time ago, he can now correct and personally say, yes, I love you. Sometimes we notice the difference in the Greek words for love, where Jesus says, do you love me? And he uses the word agape, agapao, and Peter answers phileo, yes, I have this other kind of love. There may be some distinction there. We think of agape as a no matter what love, 1 Corinthians 13, love. Phileo was a love of affection, of kinship and friendship. Sometimes the words are used interchangeably in the New Testament, but perhaps there's a distinction here. And so the third time Jesus says, do you have the phileo love for me? And Peter says, yes, you know all things. So Peter then is troubled because it's the third time reminiscent of the three times that he disowned Jesus. 
But there's more to it than answering the question. If you really mean that, there are people in need. They're struggling. They're aimless. They're hurting. I don't know of a greater message for you and me at this particular time in our lives than for us to ask, who do we love? Do we love him more than these? And are we willing and eager to take on the commission he's given us, which is to help others to find their way? Oh, you're probably like me. I need to stop saying, what about him? What about her? I need to get back in front of the mirror and say, Lord, what about me? What do you want me to do with, your, with my life? And how can I, by going to the charcoal fire and hearing this question three times and answering it, how can I go forth from here to glorify God no matter what? For Peter, he was going to die. His life would be taken in a violent and unjust way. And Jesus let him know that that's exactly what he would face as a result of his love. Loving the Lord means, as we sang today, take control. My mind, my soul, my body, a living sacrifice, as we read in Romans 12. In John 21, we might notice these three pairs of tasks that are before us. Seek and save, love and lead. Focus and follow. At this time in our preaching of the word of God, we typically offer the Lord's invitation. We ask those that are listening, in this case watching, if you have a spiritual need, a concern. Perhaps you're not yet a Christian. You haven't been baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. You haven't repented and taken that initial step of baptism. Or it may be that you're under stress, and this is so difficult right now, as it is for so many, that you just need some encouragement, some help, and some prayer. We would love to hear from you and be of any assistance that we can. Thank you again for being with us today.